Welcome to today's webinar, brought to you by the Online Ultimate Guide to State Drug Testing Laws at statedrugtestinglaws.com, the service of WFC and Associates. WFC and Associates is a national consulting firm that specializes in drug testing policy development and providing accurate and up-to-date state drug testing law information. The Online Ultimate Guide to State Drug Testing Laws is the most comprehensive and up-to-date state-by-state guide to drug testing laws on the web. An annual subscription gives you easy-to-use, online, and password-protected access to the individual state drug testing law information that you need when you need it. Today's sponsor is Alir Toxicology. Alir is a leading provider of drug and alcohol testing services to the workplace, criminal, justice, consumer, and clinical market. Alir offers state-of-the-art laboratory services at a number of locations across the country, including two SAMHSA-certified facilities. Alir is also a leading provider of point of collection testing products for urine and oral fluid specimens, as well as breath and saliva for alcohol screening. Today's presentation has been approved for one credit hour of continuing education from SAPAC for CSAPA. Further information will be provided at the end of our presentation. Today's presentation is entitled, What You Should Know About Molly and Other Popular Designer Drugs and will be presented by Pat Pizzo, Director of Toxicology for Allure Toxicology. Prior to that, she worked as a chemist in the toxicology lab for the Federal Bureau of Investigation in Washington, D.C. She is a former member of the Federal Drug Testing Advisory Board, an inspector for the National Laboratory Certification Program, and the College of American Pathologists Forensic Urine Drug Testing Program, and Board Certified Forensic Examiner. She has been certified as an expert witness in federal and state courts and has testified throughout the country. It will now be our pleasure to hear from Pat Pizzo. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, some of the neat drugs that you can find on the Internet. As Jessica was so kind to tell you, uh, this is me, and um, I've been in the field for approximately 43 years. Those beautiful plants are not from my garden. They're actually at the indoor grow room at the University of Mississippi, which has a contract with the federal government to grow marijuana. And uh, it's a really neat facility if you ever get the chance to visit it. So we're going to talk today about substances that are driving the synthetic drug trend, such as the synthetic cannabinoids, things you know as K2 or spice, and the designer stimulants that you know as bath salts, and more recently, Molly, which is a form of MDMA. We'll also cover the latest drug testing developments that make it possible to maintain a drug-free workplace, hold people accountable, and get people the help they desperately need when they decide to use these drugs. So let's talk about Molly first. Molly is touted as being ecstasy at its finest. However, you need to be a little careful about Molly. When you look at it and the amount of deaths that have occurred recently with Molly, it makes you wonder what's really in these compounds that they're, they're selling. And it's not always pure MDMA or ecstasy. So what actually is Molly? Well, let's step back in time and let's look at the 1950s to the 1970s when Molly, or black Mollies, was how we referred to methamphetamine. And that was basically because the capsules were black. It now has a totally new meaning. In 2003, the DEA identified the contents of capsules called Molly as TFMPP, which is a piperazine drug. It is a Schedule I drug. It is controlled. Uh, in 2013, Molly raised its head again, and this time it was being sold as the powdered form of MDMA. However, Samples that have been tested in labs have found to be cut with everything, almost anything from cocaine to heroin, including TFMPP, which is a piperazine, and DHA, which is a hallucinogenic amphetamine. It's very popular in the electronic dance music culture, in the hip-hop culture, and the rap culture, and it's referred to in numerous songs. And if you remember last year, Madonna got into all kinds of trouble for yelling, where's Molly, at a, at a concert she gave. So has anyone seen Molly? Well, Molly in question 
is reported to be the pure form of MDMA, and the monkey or molly was derived from the word molecule. So is molly really pure MDMA? Well, last year in September, at the Electric Zoo Festival uh, in Randolph Island over Labor Day, the New York City Medical Examiner confirmed that the two people that died were, do were dosed with a fatal mixture of MDMA, which is ecstasy, and methylon. And methylon is a cathinone derivative, which is where your bath salts come from. The Wall Street Journal, the day before, showed that federal authorities in, uh, infiltrated an international synthetic drug trafficking ring and made 54 arrests, picking up what was called molly but was actually methylon, again, a cathinone or bath salt type compound. The Washington Post, September of last year, Fairfax County Police seized 17 pounds of the club drug Molly, which when analyzed was found to be pure ecstasy or MDMA. So you never know what product you're going to get when you're getting it on the street. So what exactly is ecstasy? Well, ecstasy is abbreviated as MDMA, which is short for 3,4-methyl-dioxymethamphetamine. It's known as X or ecstasy or molly on the street. It's a stimulant and a hallucinogen. It is a Schedule I in the United States. And in October of 2010, the federal government added to the federal guidelines for testing of federal employees. So let's talk a little bit about molly. How much does it cost? Well, it can be anywhere from $15 to $50 for a single dose and about $100 per gram. And what is a dose? Well, if you're taking it recreationally, about 80 to 100 milligrams is considered a recreational dose. 180 grams for a high dose. It's a big difference. MDMA is most often ingested orally. However, there have been some documented cases of inhalation and injection, but they're very infrequent. The effects generally appear in about 20 to 60 minutes. The high plateaus and last for about two to three hours. And then you have a gradual coming down sensation, uh, accumulating in a feeling of fatigue. So how are people overdosing on this drug? Well, what happens is because they're cutting it with so many other drugs, you don't get the high in the 20 to 60 minute time frame that you're expecting it. So they double dose, sometimes they triple dose, and then once it hits, then you wind up in an overdose situation because now you've taken so much to get high, you wind up shutting the body down. And ecstasy is a very, very dangerous drug. Why? Because of the effects you have. In low dosages for recreational use, it's called the hug drug. It gives you empathy for others, reduces inhibition. It's why it's so popular at rave events causes dehydration, makes you drink lots of water. So it raves, you'll see people running around with bottled water all the time. However, it shortcuts the signal to the brain that controls the body's temperature. So what does this mean? This means that your body becomes hyper temperature sensitive. There have been documented cases of body temperatures as high as 108 in people who have overdosed on molly. So basically you're cooking your body from the inside out. It suppresses the need to eat or sleep. It causes you to grind your teeth. So a lot of times at raves you'll see the, the attendees with these candy pacifiers that they chew on so they prevent their teeth from grinding. Dilated pupils. And because it's a central nervous system stimulating drug, the effects are going to be much like cocaine or methamphetamine. You're going to become very active, very stimulated. All the bad things said about it, Great Britain is actually investigating the use of MDMA for various treatment uh, regimens because it does affect the serotonin, which are the feel-good drugs in the body. This is from an actual user website, and I thought this may be very interesting to you because there's such concern about the effects of Molly, uh, the inner drug effects, the overdose effects, 
So use your website actually indicate on their websites what you should be careful of. And one of the things they talk about is MAOIs. Interaction with MAOIs can cause serious danger, potential medical problems. Also dangerous interaction. Uh, protonase inhibitors. If you're taking MDMA and you're currently on a protonase inhibitor, it could be life-threatening. The dangers of overheating. That's because it short circuits the signal to the brain. The, um, so you have to be very careful about overheating when you take these drugs. They warn you that sensitivity varies between users as with any drug, that you should not combine this with other stimulants, and water poisoning. Water poisoning can be very common because it makes you so hot and overheats the body and because it makes you so active, you crave water constantly. And what happens is if you drink too much water, which is the same thing that happens if you're trying to beat a drug screen test and you're consuming large liquid, large quantities of liquids, you wind up turning your electrolytes out of balance and it can cause a heart attack. A small number of people have suffered seizures after they are actually uh, used these drugs. So they're not good drugs to play with. So how does ecstasy impact mental health? I thought this was a very interesting statistic because in terms of average personality and mental health, ecstasy users are distinctively different from non-drug users. In particular, ecstasy users have a higher rate of mental illness than both drug users and non-drug users. So if you look at the chart, you'll see that ecstasy users have almost a 70% incidence of mental illness, whereas drug users other than ecstasy are slightly uh, about 55, and then non-drug users at about 45. So these are some interesting facts. If a person's using ecstasy, they may also have mental health issues. These are some statistics from the National Abuse Warning Network. Um, it shows uh, ecstasy is in the light blue, uh, that about uh, a little over 5,000 uh, individuals uh, had emergency room visits because of ecstasy overdoses. SAMHSA showed a 74.8% increase in ER room visits between 2008 and 2009, it's a tremendous increase. So we know it's out there, we know it's being used. This is a website that you can actually send your MDMA tablets. If you buy Molly or Ecstasy on the street, you can send your tablets in to have them analyzed to make sure what the contents of them are. And I thought it very interesting because if you look at the contents of what they've found, you've got caffeine type drugs, you have hallucinogenic amphetamines, you have dextromethorphan, DXM, caffeine, which is over the counter, uh, zolpidem, which is Ambien, methamphetamine. So you've got a wide variety of drugs that they're throwing in these tablets to dilute them. So can it be detected by a drug test? Yes, very easily. Um, it can be screened with immunoassay. It can be screened on site. It can be screened in the laboratory. And obviously, it can be confirmed very easily uh, with gas chromatography mass spectroscopy. Uh, that's not true of all your designer drugs, but ecstasy is one that's fairly easy uh, for laboratories to analyze. So let's move on to synthetic marijuana. The range of designer drugs is very broad and in recent years has just increased exponentially. Synthetic marijuana gained popularity not that long ago, long around 2005, 2006, we first heard of it, not in the United States. We didn't see it in the United States until about 2007, 2008, and then it just went wild. So you've got your designer cannabinoids, and then you've got designer stimulants. Designer stimulants are things uh, that are mainly from the uh, cat plant. 
tapping on and its derivatives, uh, metrodome, MDPV, which is commonly your bath salts, methylon, ethylon, butylon, uh, sold as a variety of things on the Internet. And the headlines tell the story. We Every day you turn around and you're reading something else about one of these drugs and how bad the effects of these drugs are in all the states that are doing laws. So if we look at synthetic marijuana, it's now the third most reported substance used by U.S. high school students. Users report that they use the drug to avoid a positive test. After their test, they return to marijuana when they know they're not going to be tested any longer. So it's become, in some instances, a substitute until you know you've passed your drug screen test. So why is synthetic marijuana so popular? Well, the chemical compound mimics the effects of THC, but can be anywhere from four to a hundred times stronger than marijuana. It's very easily modified, which allows chemists, the ones that wear the black hats, to stay in front of DEA regulations. Simply change something on that ring, that molecule, and you've got a whole new compound. It's easily distributed, accessible online, and it's not typically ordered in a routine drug test panel. And the users know this. Lots of names out there for these compounds. What do they actually contain? They actually contain plant material. Now, the plant material they contain does have effects on the human body. In addition to the synthetic marijuana compounds that they're spraying this plant material with, they actually, actually contain legitimate plant material. If you look at Spice Gold, which is just one product, and look at the contents that are actually listed in Spice Gold, it lists bayberry, blue lotus and pink lotus, which are water lilies, lion's tail, dwarf skullcap, Siberian mother's wort, Makana brava, Indian warrior, vanilla, and honey. All of these are naturally occurring plant products. All of these plant products have an effect on the human body. Some of them are stimulants. Some of them are mild hallucinogens. Uh, they all affect the body in addition to the synthetic cannabinoids and its effect on the body. So you combine them all together and you have a much stronger effect than you would if you just looked at the synthetic cannabinoids, although those are strong enough. So what could be in these products? Well, we know of, scientific community knows of over 450 synthetic marijuana compounds, over 450. The potential to make more is real. Federal guidelines have banned 23 individual compounds, manufacturing of screening kits, can't possibly detect them all, laboratory-based testing cannot possibly detect them all because we have to get standards before we can even identify one. So what are the effects of these drugs? Well, marijuana impacts the user, I'm, I'm sorry, Cannab synthetic cannabinoids impacts the user much like marijuana does. The duration is relatively short, usually about 30 minutes or so for the uh, Generation 1 compounds, longer for some of the newer Generation compounds. So an individual in a work-related situation would have the same impairment issues that they would with marijuana. Um, Short-term memory loss, depth perception issues, inability to perform complex tasks, and um, many of the similar type effects, the sedation effects that you get from marijuana. Are positives being detected? Yes, they are. Now, in late 2010, we had a positive rate of about 30 to 35 percent for court-ordered juvenile probation departments throughout the U.S. This was before the temporary ban was put into place. It dropped slightly in 2011 to about 25 to 30 percent. 
That was after the list was published as to what the initial list, by the way, had only five compounds. And that was published, and so we saw a drop, a slight drop in the positive rate. Georgia Drug Court System took 1,000 samples, sent them in for analysis in about 2011, mid-2011, and had about a 15% positive rate. These were samples that were negative for all other drugs, and they sent them back in to be tested for just synthetic cannabinoids. The National Laboratory Certification Program, the NLCP, did a survey of all the certified laboratories in the country. They found, this study was done in late 2011. They found they had six labs providing data with a positivity rate ranging anywhere from 2 to 50% with an average of about a 20.5%, which correlated with what we were seeing uh, in actual samples. Alir, in, um, from the end of 2012 to February of 2013 for workplace samples, ran about a 0.875% positive rate, which is considerably lower than what we had been seeing. Alir's criminal justice ran about a 1.57% positive rate. Now, we don't do that many criminal justice samples, and our criminal justice clients weren't really testing for the synthetics at that time. Our sister company, Alir uh, Redwood Toxicology, uh, through May of 2013, is averaging about a 10% positive rate overall for the cannabinoids. Now, they do mainly criminal justice testing, and a lot of their clients are testing for the synthetic cannabinoids. As you know, there are a lot of um, drugs, I mean, I'm sorry, there are a lot of states that have controlled the sale of uh, synthetic cannabinoids. There are 44 states that have legislatively banned the sale of synthetic cannabinoids. The states were the first ones to take action. And uh, there's a website listed that will tell you exactly what the laws are in your specific state. In July of 2012, President Obama signed into effect the Synthetic Drug Abuse Prevention Act which banned 31 designer drugs. There were 15 individual synthetic marijuana compounds and five drug classes that were listed in that original ban. And conviction and penalties for sale and possession of up to 20 years in prison. Also, increasing the duration of time for emergency control. This is a list of the five drug classes and the 15 individual compounds. Um, in the scientific community, we refer to these as generation one and generation two synthetic cannabinoids. There was an emergency ban in May of 2013, DEA added Three additional compounds, UR144, XLR11, and AKB48. These are what we refer to as third generation synthetic cannabinoids. January of this year, 2014, there was another ban. This time, they banned PB-22, 5F PB-22, ABFUBINACA, and ADBPINAC. These are fourth generation. So you can see where this trend is going. Once DEA discovers drugs that are being sold illicitly in the United States, they move to have them banned. But remember, we have over 450 of these compounds that we know of. And it's going to be a very long time before laboratories are up to fourth generation 
we're now up to third generation for testing, but we haven't reached fourth generation yet. We did see a decline in the call to the poison control centers. It peaked in 2011 um, and started dropping. Now, there could be a number of reasons for the dropping. My own personal belief is you had a decrease in calls because of the heightened media exposure and negative effects of these drugs, as well as the federal bans on these substances. But it could also be that the user better understands the effect of these drugs, and the chemists have figured out how to make drugs with less side effects so that now they're not having bad trips anymore, so they don't need to call Poison Control Center. So what are the effects of the synthetic cannabinoids? Well, they're very similar to marijuana for the most part. It causes euphoria, sedation, perceptual distortion, appetite stimulation, depressed locomotion, specifically with URL44. That one really makes you not want to move at all. Hypothermia with URL44. Hallucinations and delusions in high concentrations, tachycardia, elevated blood pressure, nausea and vomiting. It can cause seizures and loss of consciousness. The typical red eye, dry mouth, increased pulse, pulse. thought disruption. And you have to be particularly careful with XRL11 because there are at least 12 documented cases of individuals going into kidney failure when they use this drug. So what's the duration of effect? And this is why individuals like the synthetic cannabinoids better than they like smoking marijuana. Marijuana, the duration of the effect is about two to four hours. JWH018, first generation, has an effect of about one to two hours. CP47497, again, first generation, 56, I mean, five to six hours. Look at HU210, greater than 24 hours, you feel the effects of the drug. This is why some of these drugs are so immensely popular. There have been some interesting studies uh, that have come out recently. Um, these were presented at the Society of Forensic Toxicologists meeting in October of 2013. There were a number of papers presented on the synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, there was one study that showed that if you did a single intake of JWH018, the maximum level in the urine would be 10 nanograms per milligram, considerably less than what you see with marijuana for a single exposure. A single exposure of marijuana uh, in studies that were done showed that the mean concentration at peak excretion was about 125 nanograms per milliliter. So this is significantly lower. Forensic Science Institute Polkus and his group did a study again with JWH and JWH uh, 073 and 018, and they showed that the concentrations of these are much higher in the brain than in the blood. These drugs attach to the marijuana receptors in the body, and there are a lot of marijuana receptors in the brain. Uh, marijuana is lipid soluble. Uh, so it tends to go in fatty places, and unfortunately, your brain has a lot of lipid in it. Urinary concentrations do not always correlate with clinical findings, and that's based on the individual. And users often build a very rapid tolerance to the drug. So let's look at screening analysis. If you are doing screening, you need to be aware that the on-site products that are out there do not cross-react with everything that's banned. A recent publication in the Journal of Analytical Toxicology showed that an ELISA screening kit for JWH250 
tested only for T50. So it had less than 1% cross-reactivity with other compounds. Another test for JWH18 did, however, cross-react with 10 metabolites of other synthetic marijuana compounds at at least 50% or greater. With on-site tests, one product will only cross-react with either JWH18 or JWH73 and shows very little cross-reactivity with three other metabolites. So if you're doing an on-site test, there's a high probability that you're missing a large portion of the products that are being used today. Laboratories cannot test for all products because we don't have the standards or the methods validated to be able to identify these products. We're going to be behind the curve at least six months to a year getting validated uh, or certified calibrators and standards and then validating methods. So can they be tested? Well, this is an example of a screen panel and it shows you the compounds that will screen positive. And the compounds that will screen positive are first uh, generation, first and second generation synthetic cannabinoid compounds. And I talk about generations, and I put this slide up here so we have it in better perspective. In 2010, the abuse pattern was for JWOH 1873 and 250, and this was before the ban was put into effect. In 2011, which was post-temporary ban, now we've got hundreds of different products available on the market, and we're changing to things like JW. H081, 201, RCS4, and AM2201. Post-ban, once they're published, the 15 drugs and 5 drug classes in 2012, they changed again, and we're now on third generation. And you remember the emergency ban that they did and the emergency ban covered XLR11, UR144, and JWH122. Uh, so we're on to the third generation. Now we're on the fourth generation. PB22, BB22, F5, PB22. That was the last emergency ban. So believe me, before 2014 is out, we will be on the fifth generation. This is a never-ending selection for them because they've got such a large amount to choose from. Can it be detected in the laboratory? You need to make sure when you request a confirmation in the laboratory, laboratories normally offer two confirmations. They offer a standard panel which confirms uh, the more commonly found drugs in uh, one generation one and two, and then they have an expanded panel, which is 27 compounds, which covers a much larger section of drugs and covers everything in one, two, and three. As I said, we have not yet added four. That ban just came out in January, and we're in the process of looking at those right now to get that validated. So let's move on to salvia devorium, because salvia devorium uh, is controlled in many states. It is a plant. Uh, you can buy salvia and plant it in your yard. It has a beautiful either red or purple flower. You can also dry it and smoke it and get high. Um, it's very, very popular among young adults. No one is testing for this. It can be tested for, but laboratories aren't testing for this because there aren't any requests to test for this. Consequently, the user knows that, and the user then, if he's going to be tested, will change for a short time to something such as salvia devorium, which will get him high, uh, but will not be detected in any uh, drug screen test. If your salvia is controlled in your state, the websites now are directing you to coleus, 
And I'm sure those of you who had gardens or who've ever been to Home Depot or Lowe's have seen coleus being sold at these large stores. Coleus historically has been a homeopathic medicine used for just about everything. However, if you dry it and smoke it or chew it and make a tea out of it, it's a very mild hallucinogen and will have very similar effects to marijuana. So the websites are actually diverting you to products they know are not controlled and will never be controlled. And I will tell you right now, a laboratory will never test for coleus. So if you're a drug user and you want to get high, this is the perfect thing to do. This is not has nothing to do with synthetic marijuana. I thought you might find it interesting. This is the latest form of marijuana that's going around right now. Um, you make it in a device on the far left, which is called an extractor. It's a butane extractor. You use butane, and um, you pack it with marijuana, and then you run the solvent through it, and you get this oily or waxy, honey-looking substance. Um, you put that on a metal surface, flash it with a flame, and uh, inhale the fumes. And it's supposed to be extremely potent. Um, go on the internet and look up honey oil or um, honey wax, and you'll find a lot of these different products. I thought it was just really kind of neat. So let's move on to the designer stimulants. Again, headlines tell the story. We hear about the zombies eating the bath salts and people biting off chunks of people's face, number of drugs, so we know they're around. So what are designer stimulants? Well, similar to K2 and Spice, designer stimulants are products that are made in clandestine laboratories and sold online or at smoke shops. Well, they're not so often sold at smoke shops anymore because so many of them are controlled. They're promoted as bath salts, research chemicals, plant food, food uh, glass cleaner. They're labeled to circumvent the drug analog laws. The active ingredients are normally cathinone derivatives, things such as metrodone, methylone, MDPV. Uh, however, they may also be things such as MDMA. How are they abused? Well, as we said, they're marketed as bath salts, plant food, glass cleaner, most users snort the product. Some actually inject it. Uh, bath salts appear to affect the user in ways similar to amphetamines and cocaine. Uh, individuals who use it report aggression, tachycardia, paranoia, suicide, um, and it's extremely toxic. Long-term effects are unknown. Long-term effects of synthetic cannabinoids are unknown. Remember, these drugs are not for human consumption. So we have no idea what these drugs are going to do to the body long term. So what effects are they actually seeking? Well, they want a feeling of physical and mental well-being, exhilaration and euphoria, increased alertness, energy and motor activity, and then it postpones hunger and fatigue because they're central nervous system stimulating drugs. Poison Control and National Drug Intelligence have all issued alerts uh, noting nationwide emergency room visits related to these drugs. Your only chemistry lesson for today, I promise, when we talk about designer drugs, if you look at the diagram on the left of the screen, that compound is cathinone. Cathinone is one of six active compounds in the plant cat, which is a naturally occurring plant. If you look to the right, everywhere there's an R is a place on that molecule that I can substitute and make a new drug. So based on this one drug, I in the laboratory can create 43 new designer drugs. That's one of the six compounds found in CAT. So do the math. It becomes endless. You've got lots of plants out there that have hallucinogenic properties that you can manipulate to get new designer drugs. 
One of the products that is a cathinone derivative is Nectrodrome or Drome. It's derived from cathinone. It's sold as plant food. It is a Schedule I drug as of 7912. It was one of the two cathinone derivatives that were banned. The two that were banned were MDPV and Metrodome. Number of deaths throughout the UK. Very dangerous drug. Bath salts, which is your MDPV, methylene dioxy, carverolone. Uh, it's not for human consumption. It's normally inhaled. It's very similar to cocaine as a stimulant. It is illegal in the U.S. It's illegal in the U.K. Again, number of deaths associated causes compulsive use and not for human consumption. These drugs should not be taken internally. Eight balls, I put eight balls up here because it was originally sold as bath salts. And the original formulation was MDPV, which is now controlled. So what they did, and this is American entrepreneurship, they changed the marketing from bath salts to glass cleaner. They also changed the formulation from MDPV to just Prevarolone. And they make it clear that it doesn't contain either Metrodome or MDPV or Methylone. So they're letting their buyers know. Now, there are some states that control it, but Prevarolone is not controlled federally. So what are the effects of using MDPV? The most dangerous effects of MDPV are the hallucinations and the paranoia. These are the ones that get people in trouble. These are the ones where people are seeing things, where they're attacking people for no reason, uh, where they think they're being attacked. Um, it's just a very bad situation with, the, with this particular group of drugs. It can cause, obviously, increased heart rate because it's a stimulant. It can cause seizure. It can cause kidney failure. It can cause violent behavior, and we know it will cause death. And the violent behavior has been well documented. Individuals uh, killing or attacking family members. Individuals jumping to their death uh, because they're hallucinating. There was a case of one individual who was out in front of his house shooting his house up because he thought his house was inhabited by zombies. And we all know you can't kill zombies with bullets. So there are lots of state laws. Uh, 43 states and Puerto Rico have legislatively banned the substituted cathinones. The federal law banned two of the cathinone derivatives. It banned MDPV and Metrodome. The rest of the drugs that were banned in this law were synthetic hallucinogens. These are your alphabet drugs. 2CE, 2CD, 2CT, 2CP. This, this is a list of the nine synthetic stimulants and the two designer stimulants that have been banned. This is the list of the 15 drugs that were struck from the bill. So guess what they're using now? In our expanded panels that we do for clients, we're seeing the fourth one from the bottom, alpha PVP. We're seeing the second one from the bottom, 3 fluoro So all of these compounds are now going to be used because they're not controlled federally. So can they be detected? Yes, they can be detected. And uh, this is an example of a panel that contains a number of the uh, bath salts and, and uh, stimulants, uh, molly and its metabolites. So yes, it can be tested and it can be found. Um, most laboratories will now offer a synthetic stimulant panel. Well, now that we've covered that and, and what is banned and what isn't banned, I thought you may like to know that there are three more research chemicals that we can throw into the mix. These are being sold on the Internet. They're not controlled. They're hallucinogens, very similar to PCP, and PCP is probably one of the most dangerous hallucinogenic drugs out there. 
um, MXE, 3-MEO-PCE, and 3-MEO-PCP. Because they're sold as research chemicals and not as drugs, they're not controlled, at least not at this time. Here's another one for you to be worried about, denazepam. Denazepam is a benzodiazepine. It was developed in Russia. It is not controlled under federal law. States have controlled it. Two states, Louisiana and Arkansas, have classified this as a Schedule I drug. Uh, the dosage is usually about 0.5 milligrams three times a day. It is 10 times more powerful than Valium or diazepam. Fairly inexpensive. Uh, they also are putting it in these relaxation bars called Mr. Smiley. Uh, and I'm sure you would relax if you had Mr. Smiley if you're intaking something that's 10 times more powerful than uh, Valium. Laboratories are not currently testing for this. Um, if the need arises, we may add it to our, our portfolio, but right now, um, we have not been asked to look for this compound, so we're not actually including this in any of our benzo testing. Kratom I wanted to talk about because Kratom is the new hot thing on the Internet. Kratom is from a plant. Uh, the powdered extract goes for about $66 for 2 grams and about $15 for 28 grams of the powdered leaf. Depending on the dose is depending on how it affects you. If you take a very high dose, it's going to affect you like an opiate and cause sedation. If you use a low dose, it's going to be more like cocaine and be a stimulant. The duration, initial effect in about 5 to 10 minutes, max effect in about 15 to 20 minutes, and effects can last as much as 2 to 5 hours. The most common delivery system is through tea. This is hot. We're seeing this all over the world. Uh, it's been banned in Europe and Australia already. It has not yet been banned in the United States. Um, and we're seeing it a lot through some of the treatment centers that we do. We're seeing a fair amount of this show up. So this is something you need to be concerned about. Oops. Okay. So... Now we'll do questions, um, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Let's see, I have one from Sharon Morales here. Does the user run the risk of heat stroke when used in combined combination with a hot environment? Well, you run the risk of, of basically cooking your brain, uh, Sharon. Uh, when your body starts going up to 108, uh, you're definitely a candidate for, uh, for heat stroke uh, or anything else. Um, let's see if we have any other questions. Pat, this is Bill Current. Um, hey, we Bill. do have a couple of other questions for you. Okay. And so I'll just interject a couple. Towards the beginning when you were talking about synthetic marijuana, the question came yes. up about the difference of testing for synthetic marijuana versus real marijuana. Maybe you could address that both from the laboratory testing process angle as well as um, what somebody might in, in uh, you know sort of encounter in terms of the cost, the turnaround time, et cetera, of testing for synthetic cannabinoids versus real marijuana. Absolutely. Uh, real marijuana is standard in the laboratory, so it's very easy to test for uh, as far as screening because you're only looking at one compound. Uh, and very easy to confirm a Positive, you're probably going to get results in 24 to 48 hours uh, for a positive marijuana. Not true with your synthetic cannabinoids. If you're doing the Generation 1 screening, which is immunoassay with the uh, very short GC mass spec confirmation, um, you're probably looking at two to three days for confirmation on that. If you're doing the longer expanded panel, that's done with two LCMS confirmations. So that could be as much as a week to get those results because it's got to go through the mass spec. 
Uh, if anything is identified, I'm sorry, through the LCMS, and then if anything is identified, it's got to go back through the LCMS. Obviously, marijuana testing is going to be considerably less than um, the synthetic cannabinoid testing if you're doing the expanded panel, because the expanded panel does require QLCMS uh, analysis, which is automatically going to be more. Okay. And also, what? How about? How would you respond to a question about sort of the need for testing for synthetic cannabinoids in the workplace market versus, say, the court systems? Um, I, I would say that in the workplace market, um, Bill, quite honestly, a lot of clients do it as a deterrent and do the uh, less expensive, quicker turnaround time, uh, first, second generation uh, synthetic cannabinoids because they're using it as a deterrent. They want to be able to tell people we're testing for synthetic cannabinoids. And um, if you do that, you're not going to get them all, uh, obviously, and somebody who's wise enough is going to get by because they know to go to other other types other than something like JWH-018 or 073. Um, I would say it's probably more used in the criminal justice system than it is in the workplace system. We see it in criminal justice, and we see it in treatment centers a lot. A lot of treatment centers... Uh, we'll look for some of these bizarre drugs because you're dealing with a known drug addict who knows he's going to be drug tested, so they're looking for a way to still use and pass their drug screen test. So criminal justice, I think, and, and um, treatment centers are probably more apt to do this type of testing than general workplace testing. Okay. And then I noticed we've had a, a question submitted. Uh, what are the risks to the brain uh, from MDM, MDMA use? I have seen uh, and read a paper where MDMA abusers actually get holes in their brain, kind of like Swiss cheese. Um, it's a very, very dangerous drug, and we don't know what the long-term effects of these drugs are. And if it causes holes in the brain, I'm sure that's not real recoverable. Um, again, I'm not a physician. Uh, but, yeah, it's, they're, they're just really dangerous drugs, and we really don't know what the long-term effects are going to be. Uh, I have one that says, where do MDMA pills come from, and how do these black hat chemists manufacture them? Um, they've got manufacturing plants uh, that, where they have actually pill makers, and they make their little pills and, and sell them on the street. Um, it's fairly common. A lot of it you can you can um, you'll see them advertised uh, on the internet. Uh, actually, some of these products, but they on the streets it's very easy to do it. I mean, basically, basically you use the product and you use some diatomaceous earth as filler, and you have a little <clears throat> pill maker that's a press, and and you just press the pills, and it puts all kinds of little cute designs on top of the pills. Uh, so they're very easy to, to make. Um, I have another one. Uh, with 4,000 commercial drivers, should an employer adopt an expanded panel beyond the DOT panel? Uh, what would be the <clears throat> primary focus, top 10 to 15, uh, just being all Schedule 1? Well, actually, the D, uh, DTAB, Drug Testing Advisory Board, is right now looking at the uh, expanded opiates, because that's where most of your positives are going to come from, is in expanded opiates. If you're doing DOT drug testing, you're only looking at codeine and morphine. The number one abused drug in the United States is hydrocodone. Uh, the United States consumes 90% of the hydrocodone made in the world. So that gives you an indication of how frequently it's prescribed. Uh, we had a client that went from doing a DOT look-alike panel to including ex the extended opiates, and their opiate positives went from a 5% positive rate to a 46% positive rate. Uh, and that's based on the fact that you're adding uh, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxycodone, and oxymorphone, which are all highly abused opiates. So I would say definitely the opiates. Um, when you're looking, particularly when you're looking at commercial drivers. 
Okay. Um, Jenny Rodriguez asks about the long-term effects of using MDMA. Um, again, I don't think there have been any published studies of the long-term effects. Uh, we know it's very detrimental. Um, we know that it tends, that MDMA users tend to have much higher incidence of mental health issues. So obviously it's affecting the brain as well as the body. Um, but I don't know if there have been any published studies that have said exactly what the long-term effects would be. Sorry, I can't help you with that one. And, Pat, are you seeing the question there on, on the DOT regulations? It's uh, The question is, uh, yeah. we're regulated uh, by you? DOT. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, they're not. It says um, Caltrans is regulated by uh, DOT, so are the synthetic drugs tested for on the Federal Drug Testing Panel, and no, they're not. The only thing we're allowed to test under the Federal Drug Testing Panel is what's published, and that's marijuana, cocaine, PCP, amphetamine, methamphetamine, MDMA, MDA, which is the metabolite of MDMA, and MDEA, uh, codeine, morphine, and 6-monoacetylmorphine, which is the marker for heroin. We're not even allowed at this time to test for hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxycodone, oxymorphone. Um, they're evaluating those drugs right now, but the federal government moves very slowly, so I imagine it'll be some time before we see those, uh, if we see those, ever added to a uh, drug screening panel. I also have one as MDMA prescribed for any medical purpose, and that's uh, a definite no. Uh, in the United States, there is no medical use for MDMA. England is doing clinical studies with it uh, because of the serotonin effects, um, and they're looking at it for various treatments in England, but it has not been approved in the United States. And how does the manufacturer of these synthetics get their products in the U.S. or overseas regulations? Well, unfortunately, a lot of it's available on the Internet. Most of it's coming out of China. Uh, there's a website called... Um, Shanghai Chemical Company, and the Shanghai Chemical Company, if you go to that website, uh, a few months back they were actually giving away free samples of controlled drugs like MDPV, uh, methylone, ethylone, a variety of the uh, controlled substances. They were giving away free samples on the Internet. So uh, several years ago, before they made the synthetic cannabinoids illegal, I went online and bought uh, four different kinds, three different kinds, and um, and I will tell you this: I bought it under my husband's credit card and email address because I knew they were going to make it illegal. Uh, but what I found was they came from the Cayman Islands, uh, Belize, and Great Britain is where they were all shipped from. So none of them are shipping from the U.S. They're all shipping from overseas. They all came. Um, by plain brown wrapper, U.S. mail, and uh, we're all shipped from overseas. Uh, is there future legislation on banning salvium divorum? Uh, salvia divorum, uh, not federally. There are a lot of states that have banned it individually, but there is no move to do this from um, a federal standpoint. Okay, I think we're about out of time, Pat. There are probably some other questions. I think we, that we are. Do. Yeah, afterwards. But thank you very much. Excellent information. Great presentation. And with that, we'll turn the microphone back over to Jessica. Thank you very much, Pat and Bill, for helping with the questions. On behalf of the Online Ultimate Guide to State Drug Testing Laws at statedrugtestinglaws.com and Allure Toxicology, we hope you have found today's presentation informative and helpful. This presentation was recorded and you will receive instructions informing you how to access the recording. Today's presentation is approved for one credit hour of continuing education from SAPAC for CSAPAs. Please email Jessica Bulk at jessica at billcurrent.com if you are interested in receiving that credit. Again, the email address is J-E-S-S-I-C-A at BillCurrent.com, BillCurrent, B-I-L-L-C-U-R-R-E-N-T. 
jessica at billcurrent com. Thank you for your attendance. This concludes today's webinar.